listeners. And uh, first things first, I want to make sure that I thank everybody on the team. Um, the the group at Adobe that puts together these conferences between CF Summit and uh, Cold Fusion Dev Week, I think do a fantastic job and they don't get nearly enough praise for the work that they do. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, we recognize that and say thank you to them. Plus all of the other speakers who have put together these fantastic sessions that uh, we've seen so far, you know, Charlie Earhart, Ben Nadell, uh, Brian Class, Mark Takata, uh, you know, Ray Camden, all of these people are like Cold Fusion royalty in the community. Um, I don't know who uh, got drunk at a party one night and said, let's invite buyers to give a presentation, but I'm glad that they did. And I'm happy to be here. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining for CF Dev Week. And I hope you're having uh, a great time and learning a lot about uh, some modern aspects of Cold Fusion. So uh, what is this session? This session I am calling Cold Fusion Modernization Challenges. It's improving legacy code while retaining your sanity because I believe that every Cold Fusion developer is both a builder and an artist. You know, we want to create these beautiful and elegant solutions with CFML that are powerful and dynamic. Um, sometimes though, we have to deal with the legacy code that was built over a decade ago by a developer who has long since left the company um, and didn't know what they were doing to begin with, or maybe the company direction has shifted again. Uh, and what was a priority in the past is no longer relevant. Maybe the approach you originally took to a problem can be done cleaner and more efficiently in the newer version of Cold Fusion. Maybe there's new functionality in Cold Fusion that renders old approaches obsolete. At some point, the modernization of your legacy application becomes necessary, if anything, to just retain your own sanity, uh, which is why the subtitle and the real title of this presentation is Group Therapy. Um, why do I call this group therapy? It's really simple. We've all been there. Um, I don't think that there's probably a person in this session that hasn't had to maintain or develop applications where we hated every single second of it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that look at their application, their legacy application, they make this face. I know I make this face on a regular basis when looking at um, legacy applications Sometimes it's my own code that I'm making this face for. Um, I'm not exempt from these sorts of things. Uh, so in preparing for this presentation, I wanted to address this issue that we all deal with on a regular basis from three standpoints. First, what are the most common frustrations when dealing with a legacy application? Uh, second, how are these conditions caused? And third, what can we do to mitigate these causes to prevent them from happening in the future? And just for sake of fun, I'm going to sprinkle memes throughout the entire presentation, because if we can't laugh while we're dealing with these frustrating problems, we might just kill ourselves. Um, and I promise to try not to give my presentation like this, but I'm, I'm totally going to fail. I'm just going to read slides, basically. Anyway, uh, the obligatory biography slide. Who am I? My name is uh, David Byers. I'm an Adobe Cold Fusion specialist. Um, I've been a web developer for over 25 years. Um, I'm active on the Cold Fusion community portal at coldfusion.adobe.com. Uh, I'm a raconteur. All that means is I tell stories, um, as you will quickly find out. I live in Las Vegas with my wife, who believes we are running an animal sanctuary because we are now up to three cats, four house bunnies, and two bearded dragons. And believe me, those animals are the ones that rule this house. However, back to our little frustration problem. I think it's important that um, everything starts off on the same page. So the first thing I want to do is ask the question, how do you define legacy code? I belong to a few different developer communities. And uh, one of them, I posed this question to us, how do you define legacy code? Uh, and the answers that I got were, of course, all very interesting. And they varied. Some people said code without tests. Well, yes, code without tests could be considered legacy code, but code with tests can still be considered legacy code. Um, old code. Old is relative. You know, uh, one of the developers said, you wouldn't believe it. We have code running in our application that was written back in 2017. And I laughed and said, oh, child, you have no idea. Um, undocumented code. Sure. Undocumented code could be considered rel uh, relatively legacy code. Um, code that isn't currently being developed against. 
okay, this is an application that was built and now it's just running and it, it hasn't broken, so we haven't bothered to fix it. Therefore, it's just kind of gotten old, long in the tooth and a little old and okay, yeah, that could be good defined as legacy code. Um, I think this is kind of a prerequisite. It's code that has been in production and has been field tested. Obviously, if you've written code that's never seen the light of day of production, it's not really legacy code. You never relied on it. So I think that that's a prerequisite. Um, code that's been abandoned or replaced with different code. Of course, yeah, that could be, you could have a lot of crop just sitting around in your application, um, not really doing anything. And then finally, code that isn't tracked by a code management system like Git or Subversion. Um, but for the sake of this particular presentation, the way that I'm going to define legacy code is code that we didn't create or don't completely understand or don't agree with how it was built. Therefore, we aren't comfortable modifying it. Okay. And I come across this all the time. You know, there are a lot of times where I'm working with a legacy application and I'll be looking at the code base. And on a regular basis, I look at it and say, I could eat a box of alphabets and poop better code than this. And each one of you owes me a nickel for every time that you use that. Um, first, the bad news. The bad news is that what's done is done. Okay. Anyone who tells you that there's a quick and easy fix to improve legacy code is selling you something, you know, to use clickbait type terms, nobody's going to be able to say one simple trick to improve your legacy code. No, that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullet to be able to improve legacy code. The only thing that improves legacy code is frankly hard work. It can be daunting and it can be discouraging, you know, by far. Uh, the good news is I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know, but I'm going to validate your frustration and I'm going to give you arguments to explain why managing legacy applications is difficult. Um, the other good news is your application got you this far. So it must be doing something right. It can't all be crap, right? Um, there's opportunity for professional growth in managing a legacy application. You wouldn't believe the amount of places that you can improve your skills, bring something new to the business, um, make something better than it was is a huge opportunity in a legacy application. And finally, the information that I'm going to provide to you obviously focused on cold fusion, um, but it provides, it, it, it applies to development in general, not just CFML. Okay. So like I said, up front, I'm going to be addressing this from three separate problems, three separate questions, rather. Let's look at the first. What are the most common frustrations when dealing with a legacy application? And I put this question out to the Cold Fusion developers group on Facebook. If you are not a part of that group, please go join it. It is a fantastic community of your fellow Cold Fusion developers. And uh, I want to thank everybody, of course, who responded to that. Um, I asked the question, what are your biggest challenges about maintaining legacy code bases and applications? And the answers were pretty much what you would expect. 37% um, of the respondents said the application, the biggest frustration was that the application grew over time, wasn't well thought out. Um, another 26% said no documentation or code comments. That speaks volumes right there. We're over 60% of the biggest frustrations in maintaining um, a legacy code base is that the application grew over time and there's no documentation or code comments. When you throw in the next couple of responses, no source control, no framework, you're at almost 80% of the responses. 80% of the biggest challenges come from these four elements. Now there's still others like uh, an old version of the CFML engine, yes, we're still running a Cold Fusion 9 application. Oh yeah, I can't use this particular function because that didn't get, to get introduced until Cold Fusion 11. So there are problems when you're running older versions of CFML that take away those modernization opportunities. And then um, the original developer was no longer available for reference. Sometimes the developer leaves and you know, you don't have anybody that you can ask questions to. The last section is other, which I just kind of dumped the remaining of the responses into. And these were things like technical debt, siloed knowledge, non-meaningful variable names, you know, some things that were very specific could be classified as some of the other responses, but I just kind of threw them into their own piece of the pie. Um, so let's look at this first largest chunk. The application grew over time and wasn't well thought out. Again, I went back to my developer communities 
And I asked the question. I said, how many times has a project been given to you with a complete and thorough understanding of everything it needs to do with no changes needed whatsoever, right? I asked over 100 developers this, and the responses were kind of surprising. Most of them said, never. The rest also said never. I just didn't want to have a big blue stupid circle on here that said never right in the middle of it. You know why? Because it doesn't happen. You know, there's not, uh, I've never seen a project where 100% of the application is thought out, uh, considered every single nuance thought of before any code even gets written. No, it just doesn't happen. A lot of times, like I said up front, we as developers are looking to craft that beautiful, elegant solution um, to a technical problem. We're big thinkers. We uh, get that endorphin rush when we push some code or create some functionality that most people can't do. But a lot of times um, when we're dealing with legacy applications, it's being done like this. You're basically laying the tracks as fast as that train is going. Um, so what ends up happening is that done tends to take precedence over perfection. Uh, we all have pressure being applied to us from managers, from different business units, from salespeople saying, when will my application be done? And you're, you're trying to create this beautiful thing. And what happens is pieces that weren't thought out, pieces that weren't um, thoroughly vetted through a process prior to the application being started to be developed on uh, end up just being kind of tacked on at the end. Um, the truth of the matter is most application development is organic. These things grow over time. And that's the reality of applications. In fact, the moment that your application stops growing is the moment your application starts to die. I've had clients ask me frequently, you know, when will my application be completed? That's a great question. Hopefully the answer is never. Um, I don't want to see an application that uh, it doesn't continue to improve itself or grow, or it's the reason that restaurants change their menus um, because something works, something doesn't. These applications grow over time and they need to be fed. They need to be nourished. They need to be given sunlight. Otherwise they're going to end up weathering and dying. So how are these conditions caused? There's a million reasons for it. Um, you know, the idea wasn't fully fleshed out before development began. Sure, completely valid reason. Uh, we've all had CEOs or owners of companies come in and say, hey, I have this great idea and I want you to implement it tomorrow. Okay, there's no other thought put into it other than that. You know what we can do? Um, the requirements changed. This happens on a regular basis. Uh, recently had a, a, a company that said, we are building a custom shopping cart. And we are going to uh, do all the credit card authorizations through authorized.net. And then halfway through the development, they said, oh, wait, we want to use Stripe instead of authorized.net. That's a pretty big requirement change. And when you're building a custom shopping cart, and, you know, that's something that you have to then account for because the application is growing and changing, requirements changed. Um, the proper stakeholders weren't involved in the planning this is a big one and it happens all the time. Um, there, I've worked on development teams where the developers will get together and we'll huddle you know, in our little boys club or a developers club, whatever you wanna call it, and say, hey, I have a great idea for a change to the application. What if we were to build this? And somebody else says, that's a great idea, let's do it. And they start getting involved and then sales comes in and management comes in and you know, fulfillment comes in and, and the, the proper stakeholders weren't involved in the planning of that portion of the application to begin with. Completely valid reason of how an application can grow over time and not be well thought out. Uh, unrealistic deadlines or timeline changes. Of course, hey, I need you to rebuild this website from scratch and I need it in three days. If it's a big application, that's an unrealistic deadline. Um, not enough development expertise with modern cold fusion. And this is a big deal. Uh, a lot of people, I think one of cold fusion's biggest strengths can be one of its biggest weaknesses as well. Um, cold fusion has such a low cost of entry to be able to get up to speed and, and understand what it is that you're doing. You can be effective in cold fusion very easily. 
And I think a lot of developers um, who don't have that formal technical background or, or, or uh, you know, computer science degree or whatever the case may be, that just pick up Cold Fusion and start to run with it, they make it far enough where they start to be successful and they say, okay, great, I know how to do this. And they stick to that and don't modernize their approach or their techniques or, or whatever the case may be uh, moving on. So I think that the, the low cost of entry to Cold Fusion tends to make some developers stick to what they know. Um, if you have somebody who's only ever uh, built components in tags and you tell them, hey, you should really be building those components in script, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a change. So uh, not enough development expertise with modern Cold Fusion can be another reason why applications can grow over time and not be well thought out. Not enough budget or resources, another great reason, and pretty self-explanatory. We had a, a company that uh, launched a huge application on a single server. Um, <laughs> and this isn't just limited to hardware, but they, they had their database, they had their application, they had everything running on one server. And once they put it out live, it crashed and burned to the ground. And we ended up separating a lot of things, but which also involved buying new servers at the last minute and, it, it, you know, those sort of nightmares that you want to be careful of. Uh, don't have the right tools, software, environment, or infrastructure to be able to do the work properly. Uh, unexpected results from what was developed. And this is a big deal. Um, a lot of people ask me, what do you mean by that? Um, I, I, I think that we've all developed something where we make a simple, intuitive thing and the users come by and you're like, what are you doing? Like it, 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 the results did not match what the expectation was when the application or the feature or the function or whatever it is got developed. Um, I know that some of you have seen this video before and I have somewhat of a captive audience, you know, 169 people watching right now. And yes, I'm going to make you watch this because it's a minute long and it makes me laugh every time because it's so relatable with the developer on one side and the user on the other. This is a square. Can you guess which spot that goes? The square. That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. And how about this rectangle? That one also the square. goes in there too. Yeah. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. A I think that goes in the circle. The square hole. Now, we've also got this semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit the, the semicircle? semicircle? The, sem the semicircle. That's right. It's the square hole. Okay. Up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the in, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right. The square hole. And up, la up next, we have the arch. The arch. arch. You get that arch. it goes in the square oh. hole. The, the angst on that developer's face, I can feel so hard because I've been there so many times where people just don't use the system the way that you're expecting them to use the system, um, which is partially our fault, you know, for, for not making it more obvious. Anyway, what can we do to uh, mitigate these things from happening, to prevent them from happening in the future? I hate to say it, your, your first step is you have to plan. You should invest a significant amount of time planning, discussing, researching, preparing your approach to your application before you write a single line of code. Um, create scope documents that, uh, so that every stakeholder understands specifically what's intended to be built. Um, even when it comes to modifying or maintaining a legacy application, planning is paramount. Nothing causes forced organic changes to an application more than fly by the seat of your pants decision-making and lack of planning. Now, there is an overreach when it comes to planning. Um, a lot of people end up spending a significant amount of time in the planning and design phase of their project, and then they don't leave enough time to develop, test, or release their project. So be careful that you don't fall into this horse situation where you've invested all your time and energy into the planning and design phase, and then by the time the code starts to be released to production, that's when it just starts looking like garbage. Um, the next solution to be able to help, uh, with applications that tend to grow out of control is modernize. And I know some of the orders guys in the audience will say, or die, which they should, 
Um, one of the easiest and best ways to open up modernization opportunities is to run the latest version of Cold Fusion. Some versions of Cold Fusion are nearing end of life, which means that they will have no new updates, security patches, or bug fixes, uh, bug fixes, et cetera. I told you I was gonna read the slides and then here I am reading the slides. Uh, newer versions of Cold Fusion also run faster. They enjoy new features and they give you more opportunities to modernize a legacy application. As a matter of fact, let's look back at, at you know, the last four releases of Cold Fusion. If your uh, application is running on Cold Fusion 11, guess what? You're using an unsupported version of Cold Fusion. If you're running CF 2016, your core support has ended. Your extended support ends in about eight months. Uh, the only fully supported versions of Cold Fusion at the moment are CF 2018 and CF 2021. Uh, Michaela Light, who is a fantastic champion for the Cold Fusion community uh, at TerraTech, does the CF State of the Union survey every year. Uh, the results of the 2021 survey are currently available and focusing on Cold Fusion. You can see that the people who are responding and saying, this is what version of Cold Fusion that we are currently running, there's still representation of Cold Fusion 8, Cold Fusion 9, Cold Fusion 10, Cold Fusion 11. Those are all completely unsupported versions of Cold Fusion that aren't getting security fixes. They aren't getting bug fixes. Um, you know, Cold Fusion 2016 and Cold Fusion 2018, of course, take up the bulk of, of the uh, customer base or the respondents, rather. And Cold Fusion 2021 is, is climbing steadily, actually. It's only been out for six months. So that's a, it's a reasonable representation so far. But what really surprises me about this is that if you look at that data, 26% of the people who are responding, and these are active people who are responding to a state of the union survey, are using an unsupported version of Cold Fusion. Another 27% only have extended support. Their core support has ended, which means there's less than half of the people who are responding to this saying that they're using a fully supported version of Cold Fusion. If that data doesn't change in the next eight months, um, it's gonna look like this which is gonna make me look like this, okay? The other thing is, is that, like I said, modernization opportunities with new versions of Cold Fusion, and I won't go back to the unsupported versions, but the, the things that you can do in a modern version of Cold Fusion, you know, let's look at uh, Adobe Cold Fusion 2018. Although I will highlight in, in CF 2016, the API manager, simply because that could be its own standalone uh, alone product it's so powerful and brings such functionality um, to an application. Uh, but with Cold Fusion 2018, they brought asynchronous programming, uh, lots of array enhancements, component enhancements for abstract final default functions and covariance. Uh, the performance monitoring tool set was included with CF 2018. Again, another product that could be its own product all of its own included with the latest versions of Cold Fusion. The lockdown installer, fat arrow functions, new query and array functions. There's so much more cool stuff in the newer versions of Cold Fusion. CF 2020, 20, uh, 2021 brought the uh, package manager, uh, some cloud abstraction functions for Azure and AWS so that you can be uh, cloud agnostic, uh, modularization and lightweight installer, some SAML support, CF setup configuration tools, NoSQL support, and many, 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 many more features. Um, so yes, modernize. Some legacy applications were written years or even decades ago. You know, modern uh, Cold Fusion is a robust, dynamic, capable language. It gives you many opportunities to try new approaches, new techniques, and new methodologies to make your legacy application more cutting edge. Um, Luis Mahano of uh, Orta Solutions wrote a book called Modern Cold Fusion CFML in 100 Minutes. I strongly recommend it. Go out and buy it, um, and it supports a good cause. If you don't want to buy it, uh, they also have it as uh, a, a website at modern-cfml.ortisbooks.com. Um, great read, and will give you uh, great information on how to modernize your code, how to use new approaches, how to uh, look at things a little bit differently. Um, so yeah, strongly recommend that. Basically, I guess what I'm saying is if you start looking back into your code base and your code base starts looking like this, yeah, it's time to modernize. Um, I'll give you an example. This is a component that I would have written, let's say 10 years ago. 
Um, you can see it's all tag based. I have two functions in here, one called get users, one called uh, query to array of structures. And basically what I'm doing is I can pass an ID and get a, a record from the database for a single user or not pass an ID and get all the users. And it returns it as an array of structures versus a, as a query element. That's all fine and good. You know, this is legacy code that you would see in an older application. Um, something I probably would have written 10 years ago. Well, as time went on, we started to refine that approach. Uh, I came up with this, which is a little bit more modern version of it. Uh, it's now it's script based. Um, this is actually Cold Fusion 2018 as of update five, because you can see on line 17, I'm using a fat arrow operator to be able to effectively eliminate that second uh, function. I no longer need that query to array of functions. Uh, sorry, query to array of structures function. Uh, because I can use that fat arrow operator to be able to reduce that for me. Um, and when I wrote this, I was proud of it. I, in fact, I was so proud of it, I wrote an article about it for the Cold Fusion uh, uh, community portal. Well, along comes Cold Fusion 2021. And now on line nine, I can, in my options, I can do a return type of array. So now my use of the fat arrow operator in this particular instance is also rendered obsolete. This is a more modern version where... I, same thing, I can get a query of users, possibly pass an ID and, and get a specific user um, on a single function. Let's reduce that down a little even further. Because I said to myself, wait a minute, why am I, I creating local variables for the SQL, for the parameters, for the options? Why don't I just pass that right into the query execute? And in that case, why don't I just return the query execute? and put the SQL right in there. You can see I'm using a ternary operator on line eight with a question mark to determine whether or not to add the where clause on the function. Um, I'm returning it as an array. So compare these two. These two components are doing exactly the same thing, except that this one is using a more modern version of Cold Fusion written in a more modern way um, than this one. Exactly the same functionality. Now, some of you may take a look at what I just showed you, and your takeaway may be that less code is more modern code. That's not the case. Less code does not equal more modern code. Um, very important, though, is that some people might say that less code is more efficient code, and that's probably the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, and it will play a big part. Pay attention to this, because it's going to come back in a minute when I'm telling a story. Um, does not mean more efficient code. Less code does not mean more efficient. The other thing that you can do is refactor. Uh, determine what areas of your application are ripe for refactoring. Compartmentalize functionality where you can. Determine what parts can be reused. Bring in another developer or pose a question to a developer community or bring in a consultant to ask them how they would change the approach. Now, when it comes to refactoring your application, uh, my, my biggest suggestion there is don't try to eat the whole burger. Um, refactoring an application can spiral out of control quite a lot. Uh, what happens is you say to yourself, I, self, I'm going to refactor this one little part. Oh, well, that part connects to this part, so we should refactor that. Well, you know, that really connects to the view in a different way. Let's refactor the view. And they tend to spiral out of control. So don't try to eat the whole burger. Just remember your goal when you're refactoring is to leave things better than you found them. So um, those are my strong recommendations on how to help prevent applications from going out of control and um, losing, you know, their scope. Plan, modernize, and refactor. Um, Addressing the second, uh, third, and fourth elements from that survey, no documentation or code comments, no framework, no source control. I'm going to lump together these things because they all cater to the same issue. And the issue that they're um, catering to is what was going through the mind of the developer when they were writing the application. Again, we all think very big brain. We're doing very smart things. We're doing powerful things with computers and applications and databases and internet and servers and cloud and everything all has to tie together. We have a lot of variables going on in our minds. And a lot of times um, that information doesn't get passed through to another developer. So the two things that I want to address here are context 
and intention when it comes to coding, okay? Make sure that you make it clear what your context is and what your intention is. I'll give you an example. What's this? What is it? Is it a circle? Yes, it's a circle. Absolutely. Is it intended to be a circle? Maybe. Is it the letter O? Okay, I guess it could be the letter O. Um, is it intended to be the letter O? What's the context behind this? Is it the number zero? Sure, it could be the number zero. Is it a donut chart showing 100%? Okay, yeah, uh, we're getting a little creative here. Is it an artist rendering of an aerial view of the Apple Park campus? Now I'm really stretching and wondering, questioning my life choices, but sure, I guess it could be. Without the context and intention, you have no idea what this is. Because remember, we're developers. We're not mind readers. Now, the obvious and very easy way to resolve this is code comments and documentation. I gotta tell you, there's a special place in hell reserved for developers who don't document or comment their code. And trust me, I'm gonna be right there with you. I'm terrible at it. Why? Because developers write the worst documents flat out. How many times have the people in this group worked with another developer or worked on something and said to themselves, you know what? I'll document and comment this code once the development's complete. Yeah, right, sure you will. You're lying. You're lying to me, and worst off, you're lying to yourself. Nobody goes back and comments their code once they're done. They move on to the next project. Or somebody comes in and says, hey, great, that's done. Now I need you to do this. Has anybody ever said, I need to go back and thoroughly document and comment my code before I can move on to the next project and not had their manager kind of laugh at them and say, get to work? Um, there's only been one company that I've ever worked with that did it really, really well. It's a company here in Las Vegas called Shift4 Payments. Um, and the way that they did it was they had two people on staff full time simply to write the documentation. They had a technical writer from the developer's perspective and they had a technical writer from the user's perspective. And basically what would happen is as a developer, you would finish your code up and you would go in and you would talk to these people and they would write the documents for you. One person would be asking you questions like, what were you thinking when you were developing this? Why is this variable called that? Well, you know, and they weren't judging, they weren't you know, criticizing your code. They were simply asking you the questions so that they could write the documentation. And then the technical writer from the user's perspective would say, how does this affect the user? What changes are made to the interface because of this? What power does this bring to a user who's trying to use our application? And I gotta tell you, their documentation was amazing. Like they did a great job. Because remember, as a developer, we tend to be too close to the project. We are not mind readers. Unfortunately, sometimes we kind of need to be. I worked with a company where um, one of the developers would not comment their code whatsoever. So I asked him one time, this guy named John. I said, John, question for you, why don't you comment your code? And his response, honestly, it surprised and kind of offended me. He said, look, if you're not smart enough to figure out what my code is doing, then you aren't smart enough to be working here. And that took me by surprise. I was like, wow, okay. And I thought about it. I thought about what he said. If you're not smart enough to, to understand what my code is doing. And I ended up responding to him. I said, well, maybe if you don't understand that code comments are designed to answer the question, why is this code doing this? Instead of what is this code doing? Then maybe you aren't smart enough to be working here. You know, I don't need a code comment like this. I get it. It's a cat. I'm smart enough to know this is a cat. Um, what I want to know is whose cat is this? Why is this cat here? Should this cat be here? Where's its food? You know, does it need to be, does it need water? What's going on? I need to know the context and the intention of why this cat is here versus just a comment that says cat, right? Here's a real world example. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I was working with a, a developer and he submitted this piece of code. And I looked at it and I said, this is awful. Um, you need to tell me what's going on here. So I brought him in and I said, I, said, I need you to uh, put a meaningful code comment into this code here. And this was a very positive experience. He took it really well and was like, okay, yep, you're right. So he came back and this is what he said. This code creates a hash based on an integer between one and a million. Okay, 
We use this in the user login system. When a user logs in, there's a similar function that gets run and we compare the hash of the number generated at login with the hash of the number in their user record. Okay, like I, I, I see what you're doing there. If it matches, they've won the quote unquote lottery and they get a special discount. Okay, um, I might not agree with the approach, uh, there, you know, there's different ways to do that, but you know, and the first thing that entered my mind was why not just pick a random number between one and a million. And he addressed that in his comment. He said, we originally did this as random range between one and a million, but we determined that there was more randomness applied to creating two random numbers and multiplying them. Well, that's just wrong, but I, I'm not here to judge the approach. I'm here to understand the context and the intention of why this code is written. Why is there a, why is there B? Why are they random numbers between one and a thousand? Why are we multiplying them and hashing them together to create C? You know, and I still disagree with the way that the variable names are. However, I understand the context. I understand the intention based on simply adding a code comment that, that, um, that explains exactly what it is that the user was thinking. Now that was a very positive experience because that, developer from then on would write meaningful comments and would write things that uh, made sense and self-documented the code because as a developer, somebody else could go in and understand what, again, what their context, what their intention is when they're writing these sorts of garbage pieces of code. Um, that was a very positive experience. Now it's time to talk about a story that I like to refer to as the nightmare scenario. I got hired um, by a company who had recently fired their developer. They had a single cold fusion developer and they had gotten rid of him. And it was a bad breakup. You know, it was one of those, get the hell out. We don't want you here anymore. You know, we'll mail you your last check because you're not welcome here anymore scenarios. And they brought me in to effectively write all the documentation for their application and explain how things worked. Um, it was a lot of reverse engineer, uh, engineering. It was a lot of discovery. Um, these are the sorts of things that, uh, you know, you, you get into sometimes. And as I'm going through the code, I come across this. And I'm like, okay, let's take a look at this. CF loop query equals get ID. Got it. So we're looping over a query called get ID. We're getting an ID. Okay. And we're creating rows. And in that we have an ID variable, and then an ID ID variable, and then ID details. Okay, well, what is ID and what's the difference between ID and ID ID? And what's the difference between ID ID and ID details? So I said, okay, let's roll this back. Let's go back to the query itself. So I go to the query and this is what I find. And if you're an astute developer, you will look at a query like this and already you were making this face, okay? Did you catch it? Let's let's go back, take a quick look. Select ID, IID, ID, ID, ID details from I. Wait a minute, I is an alias? Why is an I alias? Normally I is an alias for something. Certainly I'm not gonna look in the database and see a table called I, am I? Inner join ID, wait a minute, ID is an alias. Oh my God, what's going on? Let me look into the database. So. I look into the database and this is what I see. Table names, A, A, D, C, C, O, E, I, I, D, J, L, P, P, N, R, S, U, and Z. So I closed my laptop. I went out into the parking lot. I did this in my car for about a good 10 minutes. And then I went back in and I talked to the company that had hired me. I said, okay, this developer had to have um, a, uh, somebody that he worked with, somebody that he talked to, he had to have lunch with somebody. And they said, yeah, he used to hang out with Paul a lot. Okay. I said, I want to talk to Paul. So I talked to Paul and I said, Paul, what's, what's going on? What, what can you tell me about this other developer? What was his intention when he was building tables? And he said, well, the first thing that I have to tell you is that even though I hung out with him a lot, I didn't really care for him. And I liked this job more than I liked him. Okay, that's good to know. That tells me you're going to be telling the truth here. You're not going to be trying to protect him. And he said, the first thing you need to know is that uh, he believed that the smaller the code was, 
the fewer characters that he used, the faster it would run. Oh, and I said, okay, remember I, remember I said this was going to be making a comeback? Yeah, here it is. Um, he said he believed that less code meant for it, more efficient code. And I said, okay, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, what else? He said, well, he also believed that if he made the code really obscure, he would never get fired. And I said, aha, now I have the intention. That's the intention behind this. This is intentionally uh, obfuscated in order to be able to make it so that's difficult to read. So I go back into the database and I shake my head and I start looking into the context of a lot of these tables. And this is effectively what I figured out. You know, A was accounts, uh, AD was addresses, C was contacts, CO was countries. Okay, I'm starting to get a, a feel for what this guy is doing here. The two tables that we had in question, I and ID, were actually invoices and invoice details. So when he's running a query called get ID, he's actually saying get invoice details. And I'm saying to myself, self, what are invoice details? And I'm looking at the data and the invoice details are actually line items. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why didn't he call it line items? Oh, I remember because he's trying to obfuscate the code as much as he can so he doesn't get fired. So he's going to call line items ID, which is actually invoice details, which ties to the invoices table. Just complete nightmare. Okay, so looking back at his query, though, this made a lot more sense. We're selecting invoices ID, invoices invoice ID, invoice details, invoice details ID and so on and so forth. And I thought to myself, wow, how hard did he make this not only on himself, but anybody else that would ever look at the code um, in, instead of just doing something like this. And this is awful and basic and shouldn't be done either. But using meaningful variable names, call the query get invoice details instead of something that's completely obscure. Um, spell out the table names so that you know where you're getting these, this data from. Just a complete nightmare. Well, what can we do to prevent these cases, these causes from happening uh, in the future? Well, number one, don't hire that guy. I can tell you that. Um, but ultimately, you have to document, you know, knowing that applications are organic in nature, you know that this is not going to be the last time that you or someone else has to manage the code. So you want to write code comments and documentation to support what you did and take some of the guesswork out of those future development efforts. Um, avoid obfuscation. This is a big thing. Uh, use variable names that make sense. My personal opinion, and this is a lot of people disagree with me here, is to avoid abbreviations. Um, I spell out pretty much everything. Try not to over-engineer your application. The more places that a developer has to look in order to be able to find where the guts of an application are, the more time it's going to take to manage that legacy application. And one of the key statements that I just said there um, is try not to over-engineer your application. A lot of times you just need a fast, cheap, scalable way of opening bottles. Take the engineer's approach, not the software engineer's approach. You don't need this big, gaudy monstrosity. Cool, you know, it's pretty, but just open the damn bottle. Um, this comic speaks to me a lot. <laughs> when I was young and new to coding, uh, I would say, let me write this in really complex and... And it's going to be elegant and clean and one line and so on and so forth. Now I'm totally the year X guy. You know, let me write this code so that I can easily understand it in the future when I have to go back into this nightmare and figure out what the heck I was thinking in the moment. And I got to tell you, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. Look at that. Um, nothing wrong with writing code in a way that you can easily understand it. That's kind of the point, right? Um, set coding standards. The use of a framework such as Coldbox or Framework One are easy ways to set coding standards of how an application should be written. Uh, should is an evil word. Uh, if implementing a framework into a legacy application is too big of a burger to eat, it becomes too significant a cat, uh, task, then consider writing your own standards for code or adopting someone else's. I know that the Ordis Solutions guys have their coding standards published on their website, um, and they're great. They're, you know, it's clean, it's easy to follow. If all of your developers get on the same page and start um, 
following the same coding standards, the same sort of, we're going to name our variables like this. We're going to put things here. We're going to, we're going to write our, our components in script and our views and tags. Even simple, basic things like that. You set those amongst your developers. It gives them a head start on understanding the context and intention of what was happening when that application was being built. Now, there's one option uh, when it comes to uh, legacy applications that I have not addressed yet. And that is uh, knowing when to say when. There comes a time when the decision needs to be made on whether or not to scrap a legacy application in favor of new development. It's a business decision uh, that needs to be based on the needs of the application and its longevity. Rebuilding from scratch is a nuclear option. Sometimes though, it's the best one. Now, a lot of developers or managers or CEOs, when they say, we need to rebuild our application, will say that we need to rebuild it outside of Cold Fusion. That's not necessarily true. Rebuilding from scratch doesn't mean rebuilding in another language. Your business has already committed a significant investment uh, in Cold Fusion. So don't be so quick to abandon it. See if modern Cold Fusion will provide the robust, secure, flexible platform that you need to be able to build the next generation of your application upon. Uh, Cold Fusion is not the same thing it was years ago, uh, 10, 5, even 3 years ago. Charlie did a great uh, presentation a couple days ago on modern Cold Fusion and the fact that it's not this uh, thing that people had stuck in their minds when they first learned about it. Some people think that Cold Fusion is still CF pod and flash forms. And it's just, it's, no, modern Cold Fusion is entirely different. Um, a good question, though, is how do you know when to say when and nuke your application and, and start from scratch? Uh, a few ideas to keep in mind. Understand the architectural limitations of your existing application. Uh, many times people will say, we can't do that because of the way our application was built. If you're hitting an architectural limitation to your existing application, maybe it's time to consider nuking it and starting over. Evaluate how much time you're putting into discovery. Uh, there are too many projects that I work on currently that involve four hours of discovery for a 10 minute fix. And it sucks. You know, the, there's nothing worse than having to do four, a bunch of discovery to try and track down where the problem is. And then once you find it, you're like, okay, here's what we need to do. And you start doing it. All that discovery time is time that you could be putting into a better application. Uh, document where the known bugs and security issues are. Uh, if that document starts getting really big, maybe it's time to say when. And then consider all of the things that you would do differently if you could do it all over again. If, if you were to say today, hey, this massive application that we've built over the last 15 years and has a million lines of code and uh, an established customer base, so on and so forth, if you were to build it all over again, what would you do different? A lot of times that, uh, that answer could be pretty daunting. Um, so what did we learn? Uh, number one, plan. Create a scope document. Try to think of, uh, try to think through as much of the application as you possibly can. Modernize your application. Uh, Cold Fusion in 2021 is not the same as it was 10, five, or even three years ago. Uh, upgrade versions as well as the way that you write your CFML. Uh, CFML has grown so much into this powerful, dynamic, robust language that we all love. Look for new ways to be able to do things. Don't always accept the way that you built things 10 years ago as the way that um, it should be built. Refactor your application. Remember, when you do, don't try to eat the whole burger. Your goal there is to uh, leave things better than you found them. Document your application. It sucks. I don't care. Do it because future you will thank you for it. Um, try to avoid obfuscation. Don't create intentional bottlenecks to understanding context and intention. Uh, make sure you set some coding standards. Frameworks and uh, coding standards exist for a reason, and they put developers on the same page when it comes to process. And then finally, know when to say when. I keep standing in front of my words here. Uh, starting from scratch is sometimes the best solution. Now, one last piece of advice when dealing with a legacy application. Test. Create local copies of your application. Create beta environments on hardware similar to production hardware. 
um, write your own unit tests or use a testing framework like TestBox. There's no reason for you not to be developing and testing against a copy of your application. Um, developer test against, uh, a, don't ever developer test against a live production environment. You know, how many of us got this email last week? Thanks. Thanks, HBO Max. I don't, I don't know what's funnier. In case anybody doesn't know about this, basically HBO Max was testing in production and they sent out an integration test to you know, a significant portion of their customers. And I don't know what was funnier, the fact that they were testing in production or the fact that they totally blamed it on the intern and rolled him under the bus for it. It was hilarious. And it's been all over Twitter for the longest time because they're like, this is, this is just great. For me, it just, I don't know, made me do this. So anyway, now that we have all that information, we can all have a nice group cry. And we can just remember that um, these things that I'm telling you to do, these efforts will make help, uh, these efforts will help to make your development world a better place. And I strongly recommend that you implement as many of them as you can. Time for Q&A. And uh, the first question on the platform is uh, on planning but developers and PMs will say that it's not agile friendly, how to tackle that. Um, so bringing in an agile uh, workflow into an existing legacy application is not impossible. It's, it's tricky, but it's not impossible. And it boils down to, to making those small incremental changes. You know, my response to that would be um, if the project manager says, well, this is an agile friendly, okay, what can we do to make it agile friendly? What would, uh, and, and start working with them to be able to implement those ideas that give them the uh, type of workflow, the type of, of uh, integration that uh, they're looking for when it comes to um, expanding. Can I repeat the name of the unit testing tool? The, uh, the unit testing tool that uh, ships with the cold box framework is called TestBox. Um, and it's brilliant. And it can be used to test not just cold box application, but any application. You can use it to write unit tests for pretty much anything. Uh, any tips for an incremental migration to a modern framework? Yes, um, compartmentalize. Uh, typically what I have seen done lately when it comes to saying, hey, we have our legacy application and it sits right here. We want to move it into this framework is uh, compartmentalizing all of the, the functions and features, everything that that's doing and moving one over at a time. And uh, Ben Adele yesterday gave uh, a great presentation on feature flags. Uh, that's which would be a great way to be able to turn on off toggle different ways for uh, you to be able to see that framework in action and then roll it back to something if, if it doesn't work, you know, that's so compartmentalize, break it down into smaller chunks. Um, see if you can build one small portion of your application in a framework and then slowly start migrating everything over. Um, what else have we got in the questions? Why do I think many legacy applications migrated to other technologies? That's a great question. Um, I think that I think that Cold Fusion is by far my favorite development language. It's the most powerful. It's the most robust. Um, it's the most amazing, in my opinion. I think that that is a minority opinion. I think that. Many people, I think that Cold Fusion is a fantastic product with a horrible reputation. And I think that many people think of Cold Fusion as, you know, the CF pod and flash forms version that they knew 15 years ago and don't understand what modern Cold Fusion can do. The other argument to that is that um, uh, Cold Fusion developers are hard to find. Uh, there are many times when, uh, which tends to be an HR problem, but uh, the, a company here in Las Vegas just recently that I talked to said, yeah, we put out an ad for a cold fusion developer. We got three responses because we want them to be local. We want them to come into the office. Um, so we um, 
got three responses, but we put out an ad for a Python developer and we got 75 responses. Hard to argue with that when the, the developer base is small but passionate. Um, I think that bringing new developers into the fold, which is the whole reason why we do uh, conferences like this, is a paramount uh, importance to be able to uh, continue to grow Cold Fusion and make that argument of we don't need to rebuild in another language. Let's use the investment that we have already to be able to make our application better. Uh, Paul Gallo asks, is it possible to convert a custom application into a framework without starting from scratch? Yes. Um, again, keep it compartmentalized. I realize this probably varies based on the app design. Um, are there any scenarios where you would just say start from scratch? Um, of course, there are scenarios where you would say start from scratch. Um, typically, it, be it comes down to the differences between the application that you have and the application that you want to build. If you are simply converting a custom application into a framework um, and doing more of just a lift and shift uh, without really impacting the functionality of that application, yeah, that's a lot easier. However, if you're going to take advantage of it and say, uh, now that we have this, uh, this new framework, we can take advantage of more microservices or we can take advantage of different cloud obfuscation or take advantage of um, you know, whatever feature it might be. Uh, those would tend to be arguments towards rewriting from scratch. Any other questions? And say enjoy your time at CF Dev Week and um, thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. <laughs>